there's no higher pinnacle than becoming a member of the Australian Ballet. There's this strength and there's this fearlessness that is very different from other companies. When I go to see the Australian Ballet, it feels like a moment of a dream. You don't really know what you're going to expect, except you know that you're going to be enraptured. Australia and ballet. To some, they may seem like unlikely partners. Right, you watch the lines. But for over half a century, the Australian ballet has captivated audiences all over the globe. Now, for the first time, the ballet is opening up its rarely seen archive, showing us how it came to be the sparkling crown jewel of our rugged nation's artistic landscape, from the struggle to find its feet. They were playing to nobody and losing money hand over fist. This country that might not know too much about Sleeping Beauty, but good God, we can jump like a kangaroo. Notorious personalities. It's not hard to get in if you're good, because we have open auditions and we take the best. To its fight for survival. You've got to remember what Australia was like. You had to go overseas to make your name. That was the cultural cringe that existed in Australia. The incredible artists and enduring masterpieces. We look back to reveal what has shaped this world-class company and made it uniquely ours. For over six decades, the Australian ballet has been shaped by its artistic directors. Today, the company is facing a big change. International dance superstar David Hulberg is taking over the top job, artistic director at the Australian Ballet. It's going to be a kick-ass time. It's going to be hard work, but I assure you it will be so fulfilling. And I'm honored to be here with you, pushing you forward. So welcome, and here we go. His appointment clearly demonstrates the company's respected position on the world stage, a far cry from its humble beginnings. Ballet's big moment arrived in Australia in spectacular fashion in 1936. The thrill, the glamour of the most exciting of the arts of the theatre comes to Australia with the famous Monte Carlo Russian Ballet of Colonel de Basel. Stylish, bold and brash, the Ballet Russe were cutting-edge superstars. Their energy was infectious. Australian audiences adored them. And our love of ballet began. It was a phenomenon. They had this incredible social impact. To the point when, when they left each of the cities, people would go to the train stations and throw flowers on the rails because they were so upset that the Russian ballet was leaving town. After that first tour in 36, a number of the dancers did stay. And in fact, it was the Ballet Russe dancers who stayed who really built the future of professional ballet in Australia. With World War II breaking out in Europe, glamorous Czech-born couple Eduard and Zenia Borovansky were among those who decided to call Australia home. Together, they started the Borovansky Ballet, Australia's first professional ballet company. Borovansky loved his new home. He wanted to use an art form created on the other side of the world to reflect what he saw around him. He devised three original works, which, for the first time, drew on the uniqueness of Australian culture. Terra Australis, 
It's the story of a beautiful young girl, Australia, and her lover, the Aboriginal, whose peace is shattered by the arrival of the pioneer. Ballet in Australia has evolved because of the people taking risks and trying to find that Australian voice. It was Borobansky's passion to innovate and reflect his new adopted country through these works. And look, I think they were pretty ham-fisted. If you look at especially Terra Australis was a very slim storyline and having dancers in blackface and not referencing much of the cultural heritage of our First Nations people. So it was cultural inappropriation and it's very worst. But I think it's also incredibly important that they try. It's very easy to stick with the 19th century repertoire and just lazily put on very popular seasons. By today's standards, Borovansky's Australiana-themed ballets were clumsy and misguided, but they were an attempt to do something that hadn't been done before. For the first time, ballet had an Aussie accent. People could. It was so loved, doing every city, and plus every city in New Zealand as well. Ballet dancing was now a career. It was recognised as a profession. Few reaped the fruits of the efforts of many. Their names appeared on the payroll. By the late 50s, it was becoming known as a fully internationally standard ballet company. But the Borovansky's company's success was to be short-lived. Towards the end of the 50s, financially, the company wasn't as successful. Borovansky was trying to do bigger and more expensive things, and, you know, he was becoming unwell. In 1959, mid-season, Borovansky suddenly died from a heart attack. The company was left in pieces. With tickets for the upcoming shows already sold, the company's presenter, J.C. Williamson, desperately needed to find an emergency replacement. Enter British dancer and teacher, Peggy Van Prague. We hope to carry on with all the wonderful work that Mr. Borovansky did, uh, the late Mr. Borovansky. And then we mustn't forget the wonderful work done by the management of Australia, J.C. Williamson's in particular, who brought out such wonderful international stars of the ballet and ballet companies for the last 50 years. This has produced a ballet public. Peggy's arrival raised the spirits of the devastated company. But its financial problems, watched closely by the company's backers, weren't going away. Peggy came out and she finished the 59 season and then she scheduled the 1960 season. And it was then that the Williamson's group said, you know, this will be the last season. Suddenly, the future of ballet in Australia looked bleak. I think pretty early on that Peggy Van Praa would have realised that there was something unique about Australia that had to be celebrated. The Australians have a lot of vitality, and the buoyancy and joy in their dancing is something that yes. is, 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 is unusual, I'm glad to say. Yes. On the last night of Borovansky Ballet, famously, she did this from stage speech saying to the audience, well, you know, this is a great company and, you know, it can't be the end of an Australian ballet. So write to your politicians and, and say that you must have a, a national ballet company. That night, someone heard her cry for help. It so happened that Harold Holt was in the audience, who was actually the treasurer at the time. And apparently the story goes that there was a knock on the door of her dressing room and there was Harold Colton and said, talk to me about this ballet company.
well, the object of the new Australian ballet is that we hope to make it a permanent professional company, whereas the Borovansky was seasonal. But it is a follow-on of the old Borovansky ballet. Peggy, Harold Holt and other politicians rallied together to secure the future of ballet in Australia. Peggy wanted to develop choreographers to set up a school and to stage the best of the classical repertoire and to build a new repertoire for Australia. They eventually talked Menzies into giving them money for the start of, of a new Australian ballet that was going to be a permanent company, just like the Royal Ballet in England. After narrowly escaping collapse, in 1962, the Australian ballet was finally born. As its first artistic director, Peggy Van Praag was in charge of the new company's creative vision. She immediately started rehearsals for their first production with her 46 hand-picked, homegrown dancers. It certainly is very competitive. And the thing is that it's all Australian. It's not hard to get in if you're good because we have open auditions and we take the best. I think Peggy was one of those women that inspired both affection and fear. She was incredibly forthright, and in these days we would say incredibly politically incorrect. <laughs> she famously told someone to lose weight, and when they came back and lost all the weight, they said, Dame Peggy, you know, I've lost the weight. And she said, oh yes, you look so good now. I've realised now what the problem was. Your, your head's too big. <laughs> she would tell you things that you couldn't do anything about. Darling, your arms are too short, you know? And you'd think to yourself, well, what can I do about that, really? <laughs> she could be a bit difficult there, but she did love pretty people. <laughs> you know, she'd say, you might need a nose job. She'd actually tell you. <laughs> can we have the music, please? Let's start. <laughs> After two months of intense rehearsals, the company and the audience held their breath for the Australian Ballet's big debut. The very first performance that the Australian Ballet did was at Her Majesty's Theatre in Sydney, 1962, on the 2nd of November, and they staged a production of Swan Lake. It was using the old sets and costumes from Borovansky, so it was a very much a something borrowed, something blue type start. The audience was mainly people who were theatre people, and they realised that because they'd lost the Borovansky Ballet Company, if they didn't support the Australian Ballet, they weren't going to have any company anymore in Australia. There was a lot of publicity and the who's who went to that opening night. It was, you know, governors and tiaras and furs. It was a big event. The guest stars were Eric Brun, who's the greatest male dancer in the world, and Sonia Arrow. So they were seen world-class ballet. And although we were starting with Swan Lake, we were starting with gems. We couldn't fail. This was going to be the biggest success you've ever seen. And it was. The success of Swan Lake gave confidence that both the talent and audience existed for a national ballet company. This was the first full-time government-funded ballet company in Australia. And there was this sense of this couldn't fail and that they felt that they were building something important. Peggy Van Praag didn't just want a successful company. Next, she wanted a company with a distinctly Australian voice. Peggy was really an Australian disguised as an English woman. Miss Van Praag had said that she wanted a new Australian ballet, and at the time, Australia was having uh, its the centenary of the Melbourne Cup. We have uh, evolved a story around the Melbourne Cup, and I don't want to give away too many secrets about it, but it's going to be the prestige production of our season. Feature a 
A dance dressed as horses? There are going to be some dancers dressed as horses, yes. She really tried to introduce Australiana and things about Australia into the, into the repertoire. She commissioned Rex Reed to do an Australian work called The Melbourne Cup. It's just a gentle touch and you're immediately in love, yes? Rex Reed was probably the most established choreographer. Royal Sovereign, Jovial Knight and Miranda up wide, moving up into a prominent position. Prince, wider out, dashes to the lead, and he's going like a winner. Well, it looks as though you've picked a winner in your Melbourne Cup ballet, Miss Van Praag. I certainly hope so. With a new Australian flavour, Peggy was confident her company was ready to be seen by the world. First stop was New Zealand, the Australian ballet's first tour beyond our shores. I think when the company was formed, they thought that they'd be able to just go into all the old touring haunts of Borobansky. And within Australia, that worked really well because, you know, it was the new company, it was the Australian company, and everyone loved it. They were sort of leaning on the fact that they were going to make money in New Zealand. Audiences didn't come. It was because we were called the Australian Ballet and not something like the Borovansky Ballet, which sounds like it might be foreign and, and good. At the end of the season in Wellington, we were taken aside by the management and told that we weren't able to go down to the south. We, we, there wasn't enough prior bookings and that we were going to go back to Australia. And Peggy Van Prague said she'd been asked to close the company. She said, I won't do it. And they said, well, there's nothing here to do. And so she said, oh, what I'll do, I'll go to the Arts Councils in the eastern states of Australia and organise a country tour. We'll split the company into two and 14, 15 people would go on the northern tour and the rest will go on the southern tour. And so we did that for 26 weeks. It was a huge risk, but double the performances meant double the box office. For the dancers, it also meant double the work. We got to a place, the dancers would lug it, all the scenery onto the stage. The girls would take out all the costumes, press them, and hang them up for the evening performance. And then we'd do the performance and we'd be billeted by these lovely little country ladies. And we'd have a party before we go. And I've never had so many cream cakes in my life. Cream cakes and cordial, do you believe? What we needed was something hard, alcohol. <laughs> and that's how, that's how we did it for 26 bloody weeks. But she saved the company. The result of Peggy's courage had other benefits too. The Australian Ballet was seen in every little country town. And I mean, I like to joke now that, you know, everywhere you go in Australia, there's a pub, a Chinese restaurant and a ballet school. And it's probably because of that. Ballet is elite in its performance, but it's absolutely grassroots in its appeal. I believe, you know, dance is an innate sense in everybody. It's something that we can share as human beings if we understand historically how, how we started to communicate. It would be by rhythm, a rhythm connected to a melody which allows a human being to express themselves in a way other than singing or speaking. It's as integral to us in many ways as, as the voice and the words. The country tours kept the company from sinking, but the complete failure of the 1963 New Zealand tour 
still weighed heavily. Uh, we better get right into the hard work. So off to the bar and let's start the exercises. After the 1963 debacle with the company really in a poor state, I think a lot of the management, uh, who were all men, um, just felt that they needed a man to run the company. They needed somebody to blame. And there's this English woman, not only not a man, but not Australian. And she's running the Australian ballet? Oh, come on. One of Australia's most famous exports fit the bill. Robert Helpman was already a ballet dancer, an actor, and an entertainer, and management wanted him to be the next artistic director. He was in London at the time, enjoying the swinging 60s and a highly successful career in the arts. So on the scene comes Sir Robert Helpman. <laughs> well, he wasn't Sir in those days. Bobby Helpman. And they say to him, we want you to take over the company. And he thought, 12 months in Australia, and I'd lose my imagination. And so he said, no, 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 I won't do it. But I'm willing to do, spend some time here so you, you can put me on your headlines. I think you've got to remember what Australia was like. If you wanted to make your name or make your way in Australia, particularly in the arts, you had to go overseas. That was the cultural cringe that existed in Australia. He put it into his contract that he would only come for six months. And so they decided to keep Dame Peggy from Prague and they'd be co-directors. Helpman believed that Australia was a cultural wasteland. But ironically, he came from rough and ready roots, growing up far from the glitz of London on a rural South Australian stock station. A surprising start for a prodigy of the arts. He really paved the way. And Robert Helpman was always someone that I wanted to be like because Robert Helpman was an actor and a dancer. He worked in operas, he worked as a director, he did everything. Promise to you come my servant. Promise that I should have known. Bobby was always in the zeitgeist. He always knew what the next new thing would be. He was a lot of fun. He was never dull. He always had an opinion. If you have to greet the fans outside, I mean, they're the people that matter, not the society ladies that go to the first night and mm. nasty, smelly furs. And... <laughs> we were at a lunch at Government House once, and he was full of gossip. It was just wonderful. He told us all sorts of things that none of us had any idea about. <laughs> It's always difficult to work with a new director. We knew Bobby, but the thing is with Bobby and Peggy, they had a mutual respect for each other, but they were very, very different people. And Peggy was the workhorse, and Bobby was the man of theatre. He could bring money and, you know, he, he, he had all the contacts. But the person who did the classes and the rehearsals and the coaching and all of those things, and the person who had the vision, to take this company forward internationally was Dame Peggy. You know, it was her baby and we were her artistic children. Now, this side is coming in too much. I'm a grown your dad. Can you get the turns quicker? Yes. When you catch it, quick turn. Could we go Helpman's back? showmanship was front and centre in his first choreographed work for the company. The display was a uniquely Australian ballet that caused quite a stir. It was about a group of footballers and they've gone off to have a picnic. A girl comes into the scene, there's a bit of an argument about the girl. And then we have the impressions of the lyrebird, which becomes part of the bush setting. It was a very different ballet, yeah, because we were used to the more traditional ballets, and then suddenly he was this other ballet by Robert Helpman. Well, that was very Australian, really, when you think about it. Footballers on a picnic, they get a bit drunk. Hello, the scene is familiar. The display was directly influenced by my return to Australia with Catherine Hepburn in 1955. 
Kate loved Australia and she was determined to see everything. And she took me out to Sherbrooke Forest and showed me for the first time the lyre bird. Here was a bird who actually danced. It seemed also to represent to me a great thing in the Australian character. A sort of decorative delicacy coupled with great brutality. I wanted a football game, so I went to Ron Barassi and he came out and taught the boys how to play Victorian rules, which of course I'd forgotten all about. <laughs> There was a sex scene in it and people played football and they drank beer and it was quite racy for its time. There was, you know, headlines, sex ballet spectacle. It was, you know, it was a shock to the audience. But it was a huge success. It was the beginning of a huge change in Australia and Bobby, Bobby became a part of that. In 1964, under the guiding hand of Helpman, two of the world's greatest ballet stars came to help build the profile of the still very young Australian ballet, bringing with them all the glitz and glamour of international stardom. Dame Margot Fontaine and Rudolf Nureyev, they came out here and they did Swan Lake and Giselle for us. That's big ballets. They did the, the major roles. And this was the first time they did it anywhere. They liked the company, and Nureyev particularly liked the company because it wasn't British. We have a more openness on stage. We're more flamboyant than what the British are. The British are all very un-Russian, and the Australians dance a, a, a very much like Russia. I was living in London at the time. You could get a ticket for Nureyev dancing on his own. But if he was dancing with Marie Fontaine, you really had to get there very early and queue up. It was such a treat when you saw the two of them together. They crossed out of the arts world into popular culture. And from then on, they toured a lot with the company. Well, they are very talented company, talented dancers. And uh, of course, you have uh, the best um, examples in Sir Robert and uh, in Peggy Van Prague. <coughs> After such an experience and fruitful work, uh, it should not uh, sort of pass unnoticed. How is English? That's good. Good? OK. <laughs> <laughs> there was this big festival of the Commonwealth, and Harold Holt was by then the Prime Minister, and he said to Peggy, you know, I want the, the Australian Ballet to be our cultural flagship for this arts festival. And she said, no. She said, I, then the company is not ready to be seen overseas. I've only just started and, and we don't have the repertoire. And, and so they said, well, we've booked you in, you're going. It was a time when the ballet company was seen to be as a bit of a cultural export. And through the eras, I mean, from the czars and the kings and queens through to the Soviet Union and, and you know, every despot, ballet has been a very safe harbour for cultural diplomacy. Diplomacy was important to the tour, but back home, revolution was gripping the nation. I don't think we can expect to keep Australia the last forever. They should be admitted to the country. Don't you think so? Well, the 60s was really a decade of change, I think. There was political unrest. Um, Australians were protesting against conscription and the Vietnam War in particular. There was a movement finally for equality, for women, uh, better wages. It was the beginning of recognising the rights of Indigenous Australians. All of this was underway. I mean, we, we just coasted along through the 50s quite quietly. And then suddenly I think we, we found our voice and we started to look at things that perhaps we didn't agree with and 
we protested. The company really did a lot of performances, like a huge amount, much more than we do today. And I think from the original arrangement, they were on a very standard theatrical contract. And I think they really wanted to be compensated a little bit more as the artists that they were. And the company had become much more solid. And so the management were very focused on, you know, profits and the dancers felt that they were missing out. There was a set fee for, for dancers, no matter how good you were, and you negotiated your wage if you were a principal. This led to a, a famous strike in 1969. We fought then to, uh, to have contracts that reflected the structure of the company. So we had corps de ballet money, two categories of soloists, and a category of principals. So they then negotiated when the, if they were good to get more money. I think for the first time they had a framework for their employment which was actually geared specifically to ballet dancers. It wasn't just a generic performers agreement. It was a real step forward. It was the spirit of these times that inspired a bold new work. Helpman and Rudolf Nureyev got to work on a highly ambitious filmed version of Don Quixote. Bobby always liked the idea of making a movie. And it was a bit sort of like Mickey and Judy, you know, let's put on a show. A film leaves a very lasting impression. I believed in it so much that I invested quite a bit of my own money in it. It's very expensive touring a big ballet company overseas. So the film fills in places that one could not go to. We came into the hangar a week to the day before we started shooting because there wasn't sufficient power. We actually had to try and make a hangar work into our studio in six working days. I think we heard about it not that long before we started <laughs> going off to the hangar in Essendon, hangar number 12 at Essendon Airport. They had three sound stages, so they had three acts and they built the three different sound stages. They put down a cork floor, which was basically cork on concrete, and so it was pretty hard going. They filmed it over summer in a sort of a shelter, which you know was not air conditioned nor even insulated. So they were there from seven in the morning till ten at night, filming this extraordinary work. They got a director of photography who had worked on Stanley Kubrick 2001: A Space Odyssey. It didn't look like a ballet, it looked like a film. And Nureyev and Helpman, although they were the co-producers, Nureyev was really one doing all the directing. It was a great vehicle for him, but for us it was a pain in the, in the ballet shoes. Terrible. <laughs> it was unbelievable. There are tons and tons of fresh fruit about 600 pounds of fresh fish. Um, there were about 17 nationalities of extras. I think Helpman and Murray went down to the big markets and chose all these people to be extras. And um, there were thousands of candles. And Murray was extraordinary. I mean, he was dancing and he was directing, but he was a very hard taskmaster. Uh, incredible eye for detail, but he could be very, very temperamental. I mean, one day he actually punched a photographer. Yeah, he did. And, you know, he used to throw things, lots of things, when he was in a bad temper. Get away from the candle, it's the butt of your skirt, silly girl. Don Q is the story of Kitri and Basilio. And they're love for each other and they want to be with each other. Kitri, her father, tries to betroth her to a rich, silly old man. She refuses, as any um, fiery Spanish girl does, runs off with her husband. Ve 
eventually coming back together and they get married in a big ballet celebration. <laughs> Carolyn Rappel, who was one of the girlfriends, the girlfriends had combs in their hair, and there were real candles on the table in the tavern scene. And she was so tired and her head went forward and it went up in flames, the whole headdress. <laughs> so they're dousing out poor old Carolyn's hair. It could only have happened in those days, in those times when you worked forever, you put up with the conditions and you just got on with it. When they made that, you know, transition from stage to film, there was a lot more design that was required to, to create that um, authentic feel that, that, that the film had. And the costumes themselves are, are just extraordinary. The level of detail, the choice of fabrics, you know, the brocades and lace work, and lots of references to you know, beautiful Spanish styling in there as well. It's still, I think, one of the great ballet films. It is hard to surpass and it captured Rudolf at his absolute zenith of his dancing career. It was just a hit and went all around the world. And in the times where we didn't have social media opportunity for the Australian Ballet to be seen on the world stage, it was fantastic. And I still think it stands up as a great film now. The success of Don Quixote reflected wider changes in Australia. Our distinctive cultural identity was, at last, being nurtured, led by the newly appointed Prime Minister. Gough well, Whitlam became Prime Minister and encouraged Australians to come back, and also for those of us here, not to go away to make our name, but to make our name here. The support for the arts was to create our own identity in Australia, but also to make the rest of the world more aware of our culture. All right, boys, now we'll take uh, our uh, chapeau on Chaumont. Right foot in front, we've got arm preparation to start with. Ready, and. The Whitlam government was splashing money in, at the arts and appreciating it. So I think that was part of the fact that people thought we don't have to be safe, we don't have to do what Britain's done, we don't have to imitate the American repertoire. We were trying to sniff our own cultural needs and not being subservient. Open, shut, bigger. You never heard an accent on TV that wasn't pronounced and, you know, people sent their children along to elocution lessons so that they didn't sound Australian. Um, and then all of a sudden, in the beginning of the 70s, movies were made with an Australian accent. Theatre productions were put on with an Australian accent. Some of the ballet dancers spoke like Peggy because she was a British woman, so they spoke terribly properly and, you know, and then all of a sudden there was a couple of the guys like, oh, yeah, yeah, and no, I love ballet and I, you know, I used to play footy. Peter, Peter. It was an atmosphere that was quite bohemian. It didn't feel cutthroat. People were supportive, but we were all pioneers together and we were unified in the fact that we were trying to forge something of great importance and artistic merit in, in, in Australia. And I think we sensed that responsibility. Revolution in the arts also saw the arrival of a new style of dance in Glenn Tetley's Gemini. Glenn Tetley was an American. He really 
was the first choreographer for ballet that really meshed that contemporary dance and ballet language together. He was sort of like the it boy of ballet in the 70s. What Glenn Tetley saw when he wanted to create German Eye, he saw this big country, thought Australia was amazing, and he saw the breadth of movement the Australian dancers have, because he said, you know, you're all healthy, there's sunshine, there's all of this, you're not in little cramped studios, it's big. So, you know, Gemini's big. And I think that's still part of what we are and part of this Australian identity that people talk about. Nobody had seen these sort of costumes before. Now, today, they're nothing. But it was the first time, you know, we'd been exposed to wearing lycra, and the lycra was thick and very hard to get on. You felt like you were in a straitjacket. I think having the really slim line, nowhere to hide, really modernistic um, design and colourway, and the way that it's painted as well was really out there, really unusual and very, very emblematic of that time. For the more avant-garde, contemporary, loving audiences, I think it was seen as a big step forward for the ballet. And it did herald then other works, not like that, but you know, other works with a more sort of um, contemporary sensibility to join the repertoires. The new contemporary edge was a success with open-minded audiences. But behind the scenes, there was, once again, growing tension. In 1977, there was a lot of performances. And at the, at the time, there were only about 50 odd dancers. Hold the positions, hold, don't kick, hold. That's it. The dancers were worked very, very hard. And I think there was also that battle of trying to find the balance between creating new works for artistic growth and balancing the books and having ballets like the full lengths, the popular ballets. Traditional ballets are something that can sphere over the general population because people seem to relate to certain stories that they might remember as children. But some of the experimental work can actually invigorate and make a catalyst for different emotions within the audience members. And it's those experiences that some, that trigger personal imaginative journeys within the audience. You will have to have an administrator, but the vision, the vision is of the artistic director. But that vision also has to be within the guidelines of financial security. But when that becomes unbalanced and the administrator starts to um, become involved in artistic matters, that's when there's a big problem. And in that one moment, Karina, you must remember, darling, you went through all this the other day. Okay. Peter Bain was the administrator and he had the power. He was an incredibly intelligent and astute businessman. He was actually incredibly entrepreneurial. He really built the financial security of the Australian ballet. But many thought at the time he also curtailed the artistic ambition and the possibilities because everything had to be commercial. Much less aroma right in, darling. I didn't interfere with the artistic side at all, but I felt that we had to maintain bums on the seats for one bit of a word, and uh, that required programs that would attract and show the best of the dancers. My artistic policy was not exactly, didn't coincide exactly with management, with administration. In what way did it differ? Well, I would like to have gone more forwards. I would like to have done more modern works, I mean, and combined them with the classic works. I think you must have both in every repertoire. But you see, the trouble with modern works is they don't make money. 
they empty your house. So are you worried about the way in which the Australian ballet company is going now? I shall be if it doesn't, um, you know, develop a, a, an artistic policy that is forward-looking as well as including the classics. A long-standing hip problem eventually landed Peggy in hospital. While in bed recovering from surgery, there came some devastating news. You know, I can't really speak about the sadness of her resignation. She was in hospital at the time, so that was very, very sad. It was a very, very difficult time for her. She and Helpman did not get on, didn't agree. Having two artistic directors, I think it was a nightmare for the board, and they never wanted to have two artistic directors again. It was not a great exit for Peggy. She fought a lot of misogyny, really, and also some tough times with the company. The thing is, she spent her whole career in agony. She had such problems with her hips, it, it, and I don't think people quite realise how she managed to do her job and be in such constant pain. She was a formidable woman. Her legacy is enormous. She was the founding director, and we're the product of that. The foundations that she put down for the Australian Ballet were very, very strong. It has been a terrible trauma giving up the ballet. The worst thing has been that six o'clock every night when it's time to go to the theater and you begin to get sort of itchy feet, you know, and nervous, and I find that six to seven o'clock hour very difficult. As the company was overhauling its administrative ranks, Australia was continuing to change. In 1975, Gough Whitlam was famously dismissed and the Fraser government took power, bringing with it uncertainty about the future of the arts. I think Bobby wanted to really push the boundaries. He wanted to do more contemporary work, he wanted to do a lot of new work, and he wanted to bring in really internationally recognised choreographers. And at the time, the company just said they couldn't afford it. It wasn't commercially viable. They, they were very focused on getting bums on seats and they wanted Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty, Nutcracker, Giselle, you know, the big um, box office ticket items. And so basically he sort of said, well, if you're not gonna give me what I want, then, you know, he was gonna stamp his foot and have a bit of a public hissy fit. So they sort of moved him away. You must have some idea why you've been sacked. I have no idea. I really promise you, I swear, I have absolutely no idea at all. What do you think, Archie? Do you think that, that Australia has an, uh, people like Sir Robert in abundance that it can afford not to, to use his great talents in national arts? No, no, I think we're very rare for people with great talent. Um, I'm not quite sure that we know what to do with them, you know, once we... <laughs> yes, we do. We knock them. We know what to do. Cut them down. Knock them. <laughs> but that's, that's the attitude. It's a national thing, yes. it really is. It's a sad fact. And, uh, Maybe it's a little bit of inferiority in a, in a growing nation, which almost senses that it has something, but doesn't quite. And uh, you know, Sir Robert's copped the treatment. Three. And three, and four, and dégagé, tac, turn. The board and looked overseas five, for the right person to lead the company. Four, back, five. Seven and Anne Williams, in a funny sort of way, was a lot like Peggy, but a different, more contemporary version of. She was a great um, stager and director of ballets. And she had this ability to inspire really nuanced performances in the acting from the dancers. Yeah, go. Yeah, on back. Because it's just a little bit too slow. Do you see what I mean? As soon as you feel that kiss, it's like, oh, yeah, that's right. She would okay. scare the pants off you. And I remember in my first rehearsal with her, she pointed to me and she said, who are you? And I sort of went, David? Uh, and she said, no, who are you in this ballet? And I was like, I'm a market boy selling melons. You know, <laughs> she was like, well, I want you to sell the melons. You know, she was frightening like that. 
And in ballet, that was unusual. I mean, it was more of a theatrical approach. Williams was a former dancer and a choreographer, but it was her time as the apprentice to one of the world's most famous choreographers, John Cranko, that appealed to the Australian ballet. Anne came from Stuttgart. She was the ballet mistress of the Stuttgart company and director of the school and worked with Cranko. Now, she brought Anya Egan and she brought Romeo and Juliet as well. Franco's works were a good box office, put it that way, which is crude, but uh, the public loved, liked Cranko Ballets. John Cranko is a master of narrative dance, and we were so lucky to have Anne stage the Cranko works because she basically sat beside him as he created each of these works. And Onyegin is probably his masterpiece. One of the reasons why the company thought she'd be good because Onyegin is really great. She's got a really good, meaty story. Something for everybody. It is one of those ballets that dancers absolutely love. I mean, it's still in our repertoire. I believe it's Onyegin's, the 20th century perfect ballet. I've never seen Onyegin done again, like the way Anne produced Onyegin, because of her absolute impeccable eye and sense of detail. And I learnt a lot from that. A lot can be lost over time if you don't go back to the detail of the story. The traditional works put on by Anne Williams were a hit. But in the middle years of the 1970s, the appetite for experimentation was growing. When you call the Australian ballet, you should be doing ballet. And this is where the dancers fell out with her and certainly the management fell out with her because she thought that it'd be really good to have 23 dancers and do modern dance over here and another 23 doing classical over there, which didn't suit dancers in the company. I mean, if you've spent years of your life learning to point your foot you don't want to go around and say, look, take your shoes off and, and feel what a flex foot feels like. It, it didn't go over very well. I think it is important to experiment because that's how new work is evolving, but I understand that not everybody likes it. <laughs> so I'm impressed with different kinds of mutations of the traditional balletic style. I love contemporary dancing, but um, it isn't for everyone's taste. And I have sat in the audience where I've had people uh, talk negatively about works that they've seen because they don't feel that it is traditional or sits inside the box that is ballet. When you introduce a change to an audience, you have to do it gradually. You don't want to frighten the audience. You want to say, look at this. And now here's this that you're familiar with. But now take a look at this. I'm not here to recreate Stuttgart or recreate um, something from the Royal Bank. We can bring something when we go to New York, London, which will uh, excite them because they won't have seen it before. Anne was very focused on new work. Cranko was really such an incubator for choreographers. So she wanted to build that same sort of incubator here in Australia. Back five, six, seven. She back. said to me that she didn't have the power over Peter and she wanted to be able to control it, control more. And once again, the board just really freaked out. And she just sort of said, well, if you don't give it to me, I'll walk. And so she did. Oh. 
robot. While the Australian Ballet was searching for a new artistic director, a familiar face was brought back to supervise the company. Dame Peggy Van Prague. She put in place the repertoire for 1979, of which probably the signature work for that year was a brand new production of Capelia. And it was such a gift. It still remains in the repertoire. It's, I think, one of the loveliest stagings of Capelia in the world. And it slightly diverges from the traditional staging because she put more dancing in it for the men and it just gave the production a real edge. It was a really potent time, and I think Peggy had that opportunity to um, finish what she felt she hadn't had the opportunity of doing. And I think in some ways it was really healing for her and for the organisation. Just the joy of movement. This is what gets lost so often. During the time that Peggy was caretaking the company, they did a worldwide search and they, interestingly, decided that the person that they wanted to lead the company was right under their nose. Marilyn Jones was the Australian ballet. She had been a dancer with the company from day one. I had no intention of being an artistic director, to be honest. Some of the dancers, some of the principals asked me if I would apply for it. I was in such shock to get the position. <laughs> Marilyn Joes is an absolutely an icon of Australian dance, a beautiful ballerina in her own right. Marilyn such in woven into the fabric of the Australian Ballet that it was, you know, seen that she would really bring that stability to the company. At least for that moment, the Australian Ballet was in safe hands. In its first two decades, the Australian Ballet had grown to become an internationally respected company. The company was playing to 90% houses. There was huge demand. Box office was huge and strong. And the company was financially very viable. But I think it was the beginnings of the underpinning of, are we a ballet company? Are we an arts company? Or are we a commercial presenter? In the decades to come, the fight between art and commerce would continue to rage. And the matinee was canceled. In fact, the rest of the season was canceled a long-standing strike. Behind the curtain, an angry and frustrated staff had decided to strike. A global epidemic. It was a terrible time, and it affected dancers in the Australian ballet. No one was spared. It was a terrible time. And yet another change in direction would challenge the company even further. Is it a happy company? As I've said before, I don't think any company is happy. 